John chapter 18, verse 28. Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the praetorium, and it was early morning. But they themselves did not go into the praetorium, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. And then go over to Luke 22. Luke 22, beginning in verse 66. As soon as it was day, the elders of the people, both chief priests and scribes, came together and led him into their council, saying, If you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, If I tell you, you will by no means believe. And if I also ask you, you will by no means answer me or let me go. Hereafter, the Son of Man will sit on the right hand of the power of God. Then they all said, Are you then the Son of God? So he said to them, You rightly say that I am. And they said, What further testimony do we need? For we have heard it ourselves from his own mouth. And then in chapter 23, verse 1, it says, Then the whole multitude of them arose and led him to Pilate. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much that you have brought us together as a family. Lord, we thank you for the people that are watching online. We pray, Lord, that as we study your word now, we pray that you, you're, you would set this time aside for your holy use, Lord. We recognize that your word will outlive the heavens and the earth. There's nothing greater that we can have you sow into our hearts and our minds than your word. Lord, you said if we continue in your word, we're your disciples indeed. So now help us to settle our hearts. Help us to, to be ready to hear from you, to speak to us. Father, we're arrested by just how amazing your heart was in sending Jesus and Jesus' heart in fulfilling that great plan, the cup that you gave for him to drink. And Lord, we want, we want your Holy Spirit to teach us to, this morning. We want your Holy Spirit to make application of these verses uniquely to us as only he can. We pray that you would work as only you can in our hearts today. We submit our lives to you. Help us to be doers of the word, not just hearers only. And we yield to you. Thankfully, we can yield to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Well, we're making our way through Jesus' tri uh, these trials. I call them the sham trials. Um, because they're a joke. I mean, they're, they're not even serious. They're not even a serious attempt to do things appropriately. In total, Jesus will stand in basically six trials. We've already seen him before Annas. Then he was brought before Caiaphas that we saw last week. And today we're going to see him before the whole entire Sanhedrin early the next morning. Then he'll go to Pilate and he'll go to Herod again, or he'll go to Herod, and then he'll go back to Pilate. So he's going to be move, moved around, and all of it was inappropriate. All of it was, the, 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 the verdict was already basically um, determined before the, any of these trials ever took place. So this morning, we're going to see him before the entire Sanhedrin, Remember I said last week that Caiaphas, it, all of them weren't there at Caiaphas's house. And, and some of them were there, a large amount, but not all of them were there. And there were so many things that were illegal about that trial. First of all, it was at night. Uh, we saw him rip his clothes, which was he wasn't allowed to do as the high priest. Um, it was unanimous, which they, the trials weren't allowed to be unanimous. Uh, because they would believe, because they, if, if, if all that many people w were voting and pronouncing a judgment and a sentence, then there wasn't mercy being extended if it was unanimous. So they always had uh, somebody um, not, not vote according to the majority to, to maintain that. They ignored that. I mean, we went down the whole list last week of all the ways that that particular trial and these subsequent ones are, are, are illegal and they weren't according to not just the law, but also their traditions and all those protection things that were put in place to enable them to be fair. Um, they had reasons behind every single one of these rules, and they broke every single one of them. I want to just give you a little background on the Sanhedrin. 
Most people believe that the number, which is 70 plus the high priest, comes from when Moses declared that the task of leading the people was too difficult uh, when that was decided through his father-in-law. And God had him appoint 70 elders to share the burden of the leadership with him. And that's where it's traced back to in terms of that particular number. The Mishnah tells us that these 70 elders plus Moses himself are the source of these 71 judges, um, and they were called the Great Sanhedrin. And in, in their tradition, the elders described the, that this, these officers and these people that were part of the Sanhedrin, according to tradition, that they were the same officers that were beaten in uh, Egyptian slavery uh, to, for falling behind Pharaoh's quota for, for the bricks being produced. And after um, Exodus, that they are rewarded by having more responsibility in, in leadership uh, over the nation of Israel. So I don't know if that's true or not, but that's one of their traditions. But the, this Sanhedrin had been in place for a long time before the time of, of Jesus there. And they were the most powerful, influential, religious, and civil body in Israel. And what we need to understand as we look at their trial, this trial that they're having early in the morning, we need to understand that they alone had the authority to sentence Jesus to death in terms of Israel's ruling body. They had the authority, not Annas, not Caiaphas, no one else but the whole group. And what we need to understand is that, again, it couldn't be an animus. It's likely that Joseph of Arimathea or Nicodemus did not, a vote, did not vote for them if they wanted to, to make some semblance of not being, um, you know, uh, biased or, or, you know, not showing mercy there. Uh, and so th they wanted this verdict to happen. They were determined to have this verdict happen. And, and so we need to, again, remind ourselves, and we've looked through this as we've gone through the Gospel of John, that these men were guilty of rejecting Christ. They knew better. You know, the, I, I, uh, I really enjoy the Chosen series, uh, in terms of, uh, that's on TV, and we watch it. We go and watch it in the theater and everything. There's some things that aren't biblical about it. They, they claim that it's fiction. They're not trying to be exactly biblical in every little thing. But one of the things that they portray, and they're going to portray it even more in the coming, the coming season, is that these religious leaders were, mis like they were trying to do what's best, and, and they were just guarding what they understood from their limited knowledge. But Jesus said that they were guilty. Jesus said that, it, that, that they there's no wiggle room, that they weren't just not getting it. They, they were actually knew what they were doing. They were very guilty. And we've also seen this. We've seen it in chapter 15, verses 24 and 25, where, where John recorded this. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would have no sin. But now they have seen and also hated both me and my father. But this happened that the word might be fulfilled, which is written in their law, they hated me without a cause. So again, they weren't just merely deceived or mistaken. They knew he was the Christ and still wanted to put them to death. And I, last week I had mentioned that, you know, people, especially, uh, you know, unbelievers that are really kind of hostile or they want to be very vocal with their objections, they'll say, well, you know, if I just had Jesus here in front of me and he did a miracle in front of me or he, he, he taught a sermon like the Sermon on the Mount in front of me, I would believe. But that's not true. We can't let them use that excuse because back in that time, they didn't believe. They were right in front of Jesus. They didn't, they didn't believe. So that just shows you how wicked man's heart is. That Don't underestimate how wicked man's heart is. And, and, and um, it, it's so clear. And that's the thing we can think. You know, I love when unbelievers say, well, God knows my heart. And it's like, yeah, he does. That's not necessarily a good thing. You know, the heart is desperately wicked and deceitful. Who can know it? So God knows our hearts. That means that he knows every little thing that we think, every sinful thing, every bad motive, everything. He knows our hearts. That should cause fear in the, the heart of, of especially unbelievers. So these men should have, let's think about for a second what they should have been doing. They should have been pointing people to Jesus. They should have recognized him as the Messiah publicly and pointed people to him and say, whatever he says, believe it and, and follow him. 
And, and uh, his anth- one of the things that he says today is going to give us an inclination of how they even misunderstood the connection between belief and the Messiah, which we're going to see in a moment. But they, they, they were supposed to lead the nation well, but instead they plotted to kill their Messiah. That's a big pill to swallow. It's hard even today when you're sharing your faith with someone that's Jewish, when it comes to the point where they have to, you don't even have to necessarily have to say it directly. They just put, they just like put the pieces together and they realize there's a moment in time where they would have to believe that the Jewish people put to death their own Messiah. It's just really hard to, just like them accepting that their relatives, if they didn't receive Christ, are not in heaven and, and they're separated from God for eternity. That that's sometimes prevents people from making that decision because if they believe that, that kind of, that's the direct implication of what, what the truth of what you're saying is. And so they, it's hard for them to grapple with that. That's why we have to just stick straight to the gospel and their need for salvation. It's really rare that people deny that they're a sinner. You know, even in this unbelieving area, we call it the unbelieving area, uh, the biggest non, you know, unchurched area in America is the Bay Area. And people worship the intellect. They worship their mind. They worship science. They, all these things, they're so proud, prideful and think they know everything and don't have any need of God. But yet when you ask them directly, so often they'll, they'll tell you that they're a sinner. Now, that's one of the first things I do is I ask them, do you believe, feel like you're a sinner? And, they, and almost always they'll say yes, because they don't understand that that was just a, if they play chess and they understand checkmate, that was a checkmate, okay? Because if they're a sinner, then, you know, that means that they need a savior. They don't make that connection. They don't, they don't feel like they need a savior if they're a sinner, but they do. Those things go together because God is just and God, we know we get our sense of justice from God. And if you had a loved one who was murdered by somebody, you went before the judge and this, and the person went before the judge and said, you know, I, I've done community service. You know, I picked trash up at the park once. I think that's sufficient for, uh, you know, paying for this murder. And if the judge accepted that, they would want that judge disbarred in a second because justice wasn't done. But we don't want to apply that to ourselves. We don't want to apply that standard of justice to ourselves and recognize that we've, we, have, we have crimes that we've committed and no community service or good works or religious deeds is going to undo the crimes that we've committed. But God solved that by having Jesus die on the cross for our sins, where he could be just and the justifier, the one who acquits all at the same time. We can't think of a better plan of salvation than that plan of salvation. It doesn't exist. You can't do it. You can't provide salvation as a free gift apart from the gospel and apart from Jesus coming himself and dying for us on the cross and taking that punishment that we deserve. Now, we're told that that this trial happens in the morning. In our verses, we're told, you can see it there, as soon as it was day. So Caiaphas, you know, that was in the middle of the night. And, and so they waited till it was day. Mark also tells us in his gospel in chapter 15, verse 1, immediately in the morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council, and they bound Jesus, led him away, and delivered him to Pilate. So they convened in the morning. None of the apostles were there. This is how you can trans, uh, contrast it from, the, from Caiaphas' house. None of the apostles were there. No one is warming up by a courtyard fire. There's not, they don't have any false witnesses there. They may have had them ready, but they, they never even got to that point there. But they're not, they're not testifying as we see in the other uh, trial before Caiaphas. And this isn't the home of anybody. This is actually, would, it was in the temple. In fact, they would, they would meet in the, the Sanhedrin would meet in an area in the temple called the Hall of Hewn Stones. And it was built into the north wall of the temple and half was inside the sanctuary and half outside. So they would have brought Jesus into this hall to adjudicate his trial. And they, they are the ones who would can, and they're the only ones that really can sentence him to death as far as the nation of Israel. But they, they, they would need to have Rome's approval to carry it out. There are only two instances 
Well, they were allowed to commit to, to, to engage in capital punishment. They got Rome, Rome, Rome's approval. But if they didn't have Rome's approval, the only exception would be if a Gentile crossed over from the court of the Gentiles into the court of the women. So then to the Jewish section, they could be put to death. And they had a sign there that talked about that. Paul referenced that in, I believe, later when he talked about that God has put, torn down the wall of separation, talking about this separation between Jew and Gentile and brought them into one body. God was trying to bring them together, and, and he has. So um, that's, they, they didn't have the responsibility for that. It was stripped from them, generally speaking, to engage in capital punishment. And so since the, only, so the Sanhedrin can, can um, meet out this sentence, I believe this is why when we get into what Jesus said to them, it's one of the clearest, most potent times of him identifying who he is and he's so blunt to them because they're the ones that have the sole responsibility as far as Israel's concerned of sentencing him. And so he, he has a clear message of who he is. He has a clear message, and he actually holds them accountable. I've said many times since Jesus' arrest, the whole entire time that everything that happens to Jesus, it, things are not out of control. Things are very much in control. Jesus is in control the entire time. He holds all things together by the word of his power. He's holding together the molecules of these people that are attacking him. He he can call down 12 legions of of angels. One angel, as I mentioned, did kill 185,000 Assyrians. There There was nothing that was careening out of control. This was God's plan. Jesus was slain before the foundation of the world, we're told. And, and it wasn't supremely just the Jews that arranged for them or the Romans. It was our sin that put him on that cross because of his great heart wanting to save mankind. So also, it's, it's, it's possible that there was no morning and afternoon sacrifice. The morning sacrifice happened at 9 a.m. And the afternoon sacrifice usually happened around 3 p.m. Jesus was put on the cross at, at 9 in the morning and he died around 3 p.m., so it's likely that, that there was no after, and even if there were, he was the main sacrifice for that day. And he's fulfilling Passover and, and all the, the feast that was going on right there. He'd already a week before on Palm Sunday had presented himself, according to Daniel chapter 9, as the, the Messiah that would be cut off, but not for himself, as he, as he fulfilled the very day that God promised that, he would, that the Messiah would come on the scene and be presented the day that all the Passover lambs were inspected in the temple, he was the Passover lamb that was presented and inspected uh, at, on that, on that uh, way down uh, on, the, on the Mount of Olives as he was riding on that donkey. So um, the, 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 they would never meet, the Sanhedrin would normally never meet before the morning sacrifice. They would always wait till after the morning sacrifice. So why are we told in our passage as soon as it was day? They never met that early. They have a, you know, they just wanted to get an early start on the day. You know, did they, they just have a lot of things to do that day, just wanted to get things done ahead of time, like get a, a good, you know, start in, in the sense of what they had to do. No, it was because they wanted to get this done before the morning sacrifice because they didn't want, they wanted the least amount of people around during that time. So as soon as it was morning, as soon as they could officially meet they meet for this sham trial, and then they get him over to um, uh, Pilate. And so that's one of the reasons why I believe that they met so early. And we're told in verse 66, as soon as it was day, the elders of the people, both chief priests and scribes, came together and led him into their council, saying, if you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, if I tell you, you will by no means believe. Now, we need to understand that it's at the end of verse 66, the word saying there is a present tense verb, meaning that it was, they continuously said this. They continuously were basically badgering him with this question to get, them to, to get him to reveal who he really was. Uh, and they wanted him to self-incriminate. In their minds, that's the fastest path to being able to bring a guilty verdict. They had already done this at Caiaphas's house. That's when Caiaphas ripped his clothes and they said, what need, he said, what more need do we have? Again, violating their tradition and their law because he was not supposed to speak first. 
the less experienced younger people in the Sanhedrin or that were there were supposed to speak up first all the way to the oldest. And he was supposed to speak last because he didn't want to influence, un, unduly influence um, their response. But he violated that. Again, violated one thing after another. Again, Jesus is in total control the entire time. He's not trying to save himself. He's not trying to do whatever it would take to to save himself. He's trying to save us. He's trying to fulfill God's plan by drinking from the cup that only he could drink from, dying in our place. That's his priority. The joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. Now, why I have a question. Why does Jesus say, if I tell you, you will by no means believe? Why does he say that to them? And I believe he's trying to connect his identity to belief. So he's making the connection in their hearts, trying to, that because we know the gospel, we know the gospel talks about belief. Jesus' words talked about it. The, you know, the gospel of John, as we've been going through it, has been clearly saying the key is believing. He's going to say what his purpose of writing the book is, that you may, that you may, be, that you may believe. But belief isn't how they were expecting the Messiah to establish his earthly kingdom. They were expecting the Messiah to come and rule by decree. That's how all the kings had, all the kings and all the rulers had ruled in the past. They've only ever seen kings rule by decree. Jesus talked about how you should not lord it over the Gentiles and, and rule like the Gentiles do but the greatest among you shall be your servant. Jesus won our hearts. He didn't force us by decree. And so they had never even heard of a king, let alone the Messiah, have secure followers through belief. It was through enforcement. It was through decree. And they surely wouldn't rule by appealing to someone to believe. They were ruling by decree. They probably never even heard of a person ruling by in, 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 in entreating somebody to believe. And so he's saying that to them. He is stressing that to them. They, they, they would never expect this. And he wants to bring up their refusal to believe and connect that to his identity. And it was an attempt to get across and try to reach them. He was trying to reach them all the way to the end. He's still out of heart for them. And he's trying to reach them and confront them, hold them accountable. He's always trying to reach us. He never stops. Even in the book of Revelation, when you study the book of Revelation, God is pouring out his wrath on this earth. It's a time like no other time since or wherever will be this bad. Only 25% of the population of the world is going to make it to the end of the seven years before the second coming. It's going to be that bad. But he's still trying to reach man through the entire process. He's trying to reach out. He's trying to, and every time you see in the revelation where it says, and they would not repent and they would not repent. That is basically communicating to us that he's wanting them to repent. He's reaching out to them, but they refuse or else he wouldn't even mention it. They didn't, they didn't want to face the fact that they were opposed to God and God was trying to reach out to them, even in that, in the face of that. And they still wanted to reject even that in that context. It just shows you how, Again, how wicked our hearts are. We can't underestimate the power of how wicked our hearts are. Again, but in our culture, it's the opposite message. Because man believes that we're basically good. We're not perfect, but we're basically good. And we make mistakes. But God says we are sinful. And and there's nothing we could do to earn a right standing with God. We could never undo our crimes that we've committed by community service or anything else. We can't save ourselves. That's the big message is that we can't save ourselves by believing in God, by being religious, by being a good person, all these things that people normally say to try to justify themselves. God says, no, if that could have happened, it could have happened through the Jews. They had a much greater law than any law that you come up with in your mind. They were more religious than you ever dreamed about being. And yet it wasn't good enough. Jesus still had to come and die in our place. I love God's heart. I love how he's always trying to reach people. He never stops trying to reach people. He never gives up. So that's why we should never give up. Don't give up on praying for your unbelieving family and friends. Never give up to your last breath. Pray for them. Prayer works. Prayer is powerful. 
And, we, and God was always encouraging us and trying to increase our confidence in the power of prayer. And the fact that we don't believe that shows us that we don't pray enough and we haven't seen enough answered prayer. We're not taking God at his word and, and you know, I exhort myself. Notice he, doesn't, he says, if I tell you, he doesn't say, if I tell you, you can't believe. He just says, they won't believe. So that's, that's true. It's not that people can't believe, it's that they won't believe. Jesus has already cried over the city of Jerusalem. We're told in Luke 13, verse 34, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I have wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you were not willing. Not that you couldn't, you weren't willing. That's important for us to understand. See, God doesn't override our free will. He honors our free will to the point of allowing us to be eternally separated from him. He doesn't want to violate our free will. So we have to invite that. And I always tell unbelievers, why would you think that you're going to heaven when you want nothing to do with God now? Why would he force you to go to heaven against your will for all eternity? That wouldn't be appropriate, would it? Do you think he should force you to go to heaven when you want nothing to do with him right now? (laughs) Ask him that. Well, I don't know. It doesn't seem right that he'd send me to heaven. You see the crazy that's going on here. Yeah, you believe in aliens. Oh, that's scientific. That's great. You know, there's just craziness. But we, you know, we have to present the gospel clearly. So they weren't willing and people aren't willing today. And, and this, is, this is true today. They're, they're not willing. And so what God does, and this is where we can come in inappropriately, that he allows people to reap the consequences of their bad decisions. And we are tempted sometimes, and this is true of our own kids for sure, we want to rescue them and keep them from having really bad things happen. But some of the times those very bad things that can happen are the very things that can work towards them realizing that they need a savior. And we can't, we can't um, rescue them from that. We have to, I mean, life is hard. The way of the transgressor is hard, except when parents come in and rescue their kids. No, it doesn't say that. The way of the transgressor is hard. We have to let people reap what they sow because God is not mocked. And we have to recognize that God uses those things to get them to humble themselves and realize, I'm not doing a really good job of running my life. I think I might need to submit to God and let him run my life. And ultimately, it's a heart issue. Jesus said, men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil, and they don't want to come into the light lest their deeds be exposed. He didn't say men love darkness because their arguments are better. He said, men love darkness because their deeds are evil. That's the issue. It's a heart issue. You're never going to satisfy someone with intellectual arguments if their heart isn't willing to submit to God and admit that they need God because they'll make excuses for every little thing possible and try to talk their way out of it. So that's why we shouldn't be striving to try to be right in every conversation. Uh, You know, people want fights. They want you to argue with them. And I'm like, I'm not going to fight you. I'm not going to argue with you. I'll give you reasons if you're truly open to truth, but I'm going to get right back to the gospel because that's where the power is. That's where the power is. And I'm going to align myself with the things that God says are powerful. Now in verse 68, Jesus is going to make another statement which indicts them. Look at me at verse 68. And if I also ask you, you will by no means answer me or let me go. Ask them what? If he's the Christ. If he's the Christ. Jesus is saying, if I ask you the same question, am I the Christ? Tell us. He's saying, you will by no means answer me or let me go. He's he's basically implying they know the truth, but would refuse to admit it to him. Again, who's on trial here? Jesus is in control. He's taking control of the conversation. He's in control of what's happening in the room. Jesus knows they know who he is. They won't answer honestly, and they won't let him go. I said before, it didn't take all of them to arrest him. He'd be arrested by one person. I mean, he's willing. He doesn't, no one takes his life. He lays it down. If he lays it down, he can take it up again. So Jesus is confronting them. He's confronting, he's already revealed to them that his messiahship is connected to belief, unlike other rulers, and they don't believe. And they, they needed to believe. It's not that they couldn't believe, it's that they wouldn't believe. How do you deal with somebody that just won't believe? 
you keep praying for him and you keep being a godly example and you keep loving him and you don't lose sleep over it. It's not worth the lack of sleep. You can't make someone believe when they're not willing to. That's between them and the Lord. So he's confronting them and, and it's not the other way around. He, they're not holding him accountable. He's holding them accountable and exposing them for the liars that they were. But he doesn't stop there. He goes even further. He's going to claim deity again, just like he did at Caiaphas' house. So look at verse 50, 69. Hereafter, the Son of Man will sit on the right hand of the power of God. That's a huge statement. Remember the reaction when he said that to them at Caiaphas' house? Now he's saying it again. And I, and I told you that last week that, that um, you know, him saying that was claiming to be God. As we've seen through the whole book of John, the deity of Christ is one of the main themes in the book of John, that he is divine. And he references Daniel 7, and we read it last week. It's a direct quote from, from Daniel chapter 7. And again, he's claiming to be divine. Again, don't let a, an unbelieving Jewish person try to say that they were never expecting the Messiah to be God. Isaiah 9, 6 says he'd be the mighty God. Psalm 2 talks about the son and, and the whole, you can't read that and not understand that the son is, is, is divine. And, and then they're going to say in a second, they're going to ask him just like they did in Caiaphas' house. Are you then the son of God? They knew that that they went together. They knew that this, with the, the son of man, all the times that the, the Bible has the Son of Man, Jesus' favorite title for himself. It's very messianic. They knew that, that that passage in Daniel chapter 7 is definitely to communicating that he is divine. So they knew that. So they asked him directly in verse 70. Then they all said, Are you then the Son of God? So he said to them, You rightly say that I am. So he tells the truth. You rightly say that I am. So he gave them what they wanted. They wanted him to be able to say that. If it weren't true, he would be guilty of blasphemy. But it was true. And he can't lie. God cannot lie. He had to tell the truth. And again, he's not trying to save himself. He's going to the cross to save mankind. He's going to be obedient to the Father. He said in the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will, but thy will be done. He was totally submitted. They respond in verse 71. And they said, what further testimony do we need for we have heard it ourselves from our, his own mouth. And then in chapter 23, verse 1, we're told, then the whole multitude of them arose and led him to Pilate. What a sad scene. So sad. The son being condemned and judged by the very religious leaders who were supposed to acknowledge him when he came. They said they didn't need any further testimony because he self-incriminated himself. Again, just shows how wicked man's heart is. That they knew he was the Messiah. He, he, he had said, another, if I hadn't done the things I'd done, they wouldn't be guilty. But be, I did those things, and so their sin remains. There's all these prophecies that he fulfilled. He was born of a virgin, just like the scriptures foretold. He was born in Bethlehem, just like the scriptures said. He was a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The Messiah would have to be through that lineage. He spent time in Egypt, as the scriptures foretold. He healed multitudes, as the scriptures said the Messiah would, would do. He taught using parables. It says that he would do that. He was a Nazarene. I could go on and on. He fulfilled all these prophecies, hundreds and hundreds of prophecies. He fulfilled. There was no, he said at one point, who among you convicts me of sin? And they were silent. They couldn't convict him of sin. They had to come up with false witnesses that lied about things. And of all the people that you wouldn't say that in front of, if you were a sinner, it'd be the Pharisees because they knew the law, at least they claimed to. And, and so all these prophecies, and he presented himself to Israel on, the, on that day, on, on uh, Palm Sunday. And, and, and there, to the very day, he fulfilled that prophecy. I think about what the world would do if Jesus were alive today. You know, people wear crosses. They talk about Jesus. They talk about God for sure. And, and, and they, they claim there's a lot of fans out there. Jesus has a lot of fans, but he's not looking for fans. He's looking for disciples. He's looking for followers. But what would the world do with Jesus today? 
they'd crucify him all over again. They would hate him. They hate us because we say the same things that Jesus said. The first time that Jesus said, I, if you were here today, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. They would hate him just for that alone, just for that one <laughs> statement. Because mankind is guilty, and the Holy Spirit is working all the time, convicting the world of sin and righteousness and of judgment. And they, and they don't like that message, because it's a message that communicates that they're not right with God, and, and that God's going to judge them. Want to see an unbeliever mad? Tell them that God's going to judge him for their sin. That's a good way to get an unbeliever mad. But it's true. God is going to judge them. And you want to face Jesus as your, as your Savior, not face him as your judge. It's too late at that time. When every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father, you want that, that already being true in terms of him being your Lord when you say that to him. If you're saying it because now he's before him as your judge, it's too late. So they hated that message. They hated it then. They hate it today. And so, you know, these, these clear verses that communicate that they were guilty. They were guilty of rejecting him. This was the big trial. This was the big one. This was the one that God um, held them accountable over the most because they were the religious body. They were the religious rulers. There was no one higher than them. And they were the one that sealed his guilt. Jesus was primarily sent to Israel, not Herod, not Rome. He was sent to Israel. These religious leaders had the scriptures. He fulfilled the scriptures. Remember on the road to Emmaus, when he said to them, you know, ought not the son of, or the Messiah, the Christ die and suffer these things? And he rebuked them, not for rejecting or not believing the women's testimony, but, but because they didn't believe the scriptures. The scriptures had said that. They were custodians of the scriptures. And so that's the expectation that God had, that they would see that he fulfilled these scriptures and that and they, would, they would accept him in mass and point the people to him. But they were blind guides. And he rebukes them in Matthew chapter 19, and he talks about how they would travel all this distance to make a convert, but make them twice the son of hell as they were. And they had put loads on people and not be willing to lift a finger to remove these loads of them, this, these, these man-made rules and, and these things that he, they put on people, these, these, this legalism. So they rejected him and God was holding them accountable. Jesus was holding them accountable. This is why Jesus wept when he wept over the city because he foresaw the future, 40 years, 38 years or whatever it was in the future when Rome would lay siege to Jerusalem. When that general Titus would come forth, would cut off their supply lines, surround the city, and he would just be merciless and throw those stones down from the temple that are still there today. You can see them in Israel. And, and everything that he said was exactly what was going to happen. And he wept because he knew that that was going to happen. It was, it was destroyed and they would be scattered until officially on May 14th, 1948, they became a nation once again. And that prophetic time clock started ticking in terms of God wrapping all of it up. And it's getting closer and it's getting closer. God fulfilled prophecy and brought them back into their own land, never to be uprooted again. I have commentaries in my, my library where they're looking at these passages where it talks about the, God giving them back, bringing them back into the land and they have no idea how that could happen. They predate 1948, these commentaries. They have no idea how it could happen. They can't picture it. But yet it happened. It happened in our time. No other people group have ever been scattered like that for that long and maintained their identity, maintained all of their, their feasts and their religion and everything, maintained the language and, and brought back to their own land. It's never happened before. So... We'll stop there, but we're, we're in the middle of these trials. We're going to go to Pilate. We're going to see what he says. He's going to go back to Herod, then to go back to Pilate. We're working step by step. But the big theme is that I wanted to highlight, as I've highlighted all through these trials, is that the Pharisees were guilty. The religious leaders were guilty. They knew who Jesus was. And it's just so amazing how wicked their hearts were that 
He was such a threat to their power, such a threat to how people esteemed them highly, threat to their money, their, their position, their status. And Jesus talked about how they loved to sit in the seat of Moses and they loved the notoriety. They loved praying before men so they looked like they were so spiritual. But inside in the cup, it was filthy. And he need, they needed to clean the inside of the cup so the outside of the cup could be clean. And he exposed them for who they were. They loved that so much, they were willing to put their Messiah to death. They're the God, the God of the universe. And remember, Jesus is at this trial before the Sanhedrin, and he's physically hurting from the beating that he took at Caiaphas' house. Probably hadn't slept at all, and he's hurting from getting punched in the face. He's enduring this, you know, probably as he's talking to them, it, his jaw probably hurts. He probably has a horrible headache. I mean, who knows what he had suffered and what he's going through in this moment when he's still trying to reach them, still confronting them, still holding them accountable, and he's there leading the situation in control the entire time. Man's heart is wicked. I'll close with this. At the end of the thousand-year millennium, so after the rapture, after the seven-year tribulation, after the second coming of Christ, he sets up his thousand-year millennium. At the end of that thousand-year millennium, wicked man's still going to want to rebel. Not only has Jesus, they've seen Jesus, but they've seen him, been under his rule for all this time, but yet they still want to rebel. They still want to rebel. So Satan is loosed for a time, and they gather together to attack, and then God consumes them with fire, we're told in Revelation, and devours them. And then the great white throne judgment happens and everything. So that just shows you again how wicked man's heart is. They're in Jesus' presence. They're seeing the wisdom of his rule. They're seeing who he is. Like we know Jesus. We know how loving and appropriate and gracious and patient and all those things. They experience that firsthand in the millennium, but yet still want to rebel at the end. It just shows you again how wicked man's heart is. It just also shows us we need to preach the gospel. We need to be bold with our faith and preach the gospel. He's coming soon. And people are going to die before even the rapture happens. So we need to preach that gospel. There's a finite number of Gentiles that are going to get saved. Paul refers to it as the fullness of the Gentiles. There's a finite number. We don't know what that number is. If you're here and you're that last one, you better, not, you better repent and better get saved because you're holding everything up. So we need to get with the program. No, but we don't know who, how many, what that number is. We don't know. But there's a point in time where that's going to be fulfilled. Jesus is going to say, come up here. He's going to say, you know, he's going to come and snatch us up. And we're going to be with him in the clouds and go back to see our loved ones, go to heaven, and then wait for seven years in heaven. And then we're going to come back with him at the, at the, at the, uh, the second coming. Super excited for that. It's amazing to see how Jesus handles himself in the context of this horrific treatment and still is in control, and still exposing a sinful man's heart. It's amazing. Let's pray together. Thank you, Father, for all that's here. Thank you that you speak to us and you draw us close to yourself. We're so grateful for your great grace, Lord. We pray for anyone here that doesn't know you. We pray that they would surrender their life to you and make that decision for you after they repent and trust in you. Uh, for their salvation, Lord. And we just thank you, Lord, that, that you reveal his great heart through all of this. We love him, Lord, and we pray that you would use us to bring many, many people to come to know you. We pray that this church would do exceedingly abundantly above all we could ever do or think because of you and your grace working through us, Lord. We're so grateful that you use us despite ourselves. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.